prepared, I'm prepared in season and out of season. That's good. But one of these days we'll get back to Psalm 119. Um, yeah. We're going to go instead of Matthew 23. And I can't get this, I can't get this, uh, out of my mind um, at all. And uh, this class I'm doing on, on Tuesday nights, it, it's, the Lord has a sense of humor sometimes. You know what I'm um, I have, when I first got saved, if anybody asked me what I was called to do, I told them I was being a missionary. You might think, where did that get switched? I don't think it actually got switched. I think it matured into exactly what God wanted it to be. Um, because when we think of missionary, the first thing we always think of is overseas. That's the first thing we think of. And um, the thing that we need to understand is that when Jesus gave the call um, for the purpose of ministry, he said Jerusalem, Judea, and then the other most parts of the earth. So your first mission is at home. Um, if our home is falling apart, then we've got no business going anywhere else unless God just absolutely just knocks it over heaven's sins. And um, this is our group. This is our home. And, uh, and Jerusalem, although born in Nazareth, um, his home was Jerusalem, and that's Jesus. And Jesus had a burden for his home. He had a real strong burden for his home. Um, he went everywhere else. We know Jesus went to Samaria. We know Jesus went to just all kinds of different places. Um, long ways. Some places he he went, you know, he was welcomed. There were some places he was not welcomed. The religious people hated him. But the world seemed to love him until he went to the cross. And then there were only like three or four people standing there. So it didn't matter at the end whether it was the world or whether it was a religious crowd. A lot of people didn't really like him, if you really think about it. At least to the point that when it came to the time that it actually mattered at the cross, they didn't show up. Um, and some would say well, that, that was a prophetic word that not many would show up. But you know what? There's nothing in Scripture that says how many would have actually been there. There's talk about, you know, even to the very detail, and here's what's interesting about it, even to the very detail of the fact that they're arguing over the clothes that Jesus wore and how much that they would pay for it, every bit of that's prophesied in the Old Testament. But there's never one thing mentioned of how many people would actually be at the cross when he was on the cross. No one was ever mentioned. So to me, it, it, it tells me that God left that up to people to make the decision as to whether they were going to actually be there. Wow. And when it came down to business, and it came down to, are you really going to serve me? Are you really going to believe my truth? Are you really going to believe that I'm the Savior of the world? There's like three people, four people at the most, that was there. Wow. What happened to the over 5,000 that he fed in a miraculous feeding? What happened to uh, Lazarus? You know, there's no mention of Lazarus being there. Jesus raised him from the dead, but there's no mention of him being there. What, what about all these, you know, when he crossed, you know, walk across the water? The disciples weren't even there. His closest friends weren't even there. Think of that. Except one, and that's little John. He was a teenager. Wow. To me, that just rattles me. Just, just, rattles, just rattles the tar out of me. Why? Because when we, when we sit and we think about the cross and we think about the people that were actually there, we have to ask ourselves, would we have been there? Let's ask ourselves that tough question because I want you to just think of your own life outside of church on Sunday morning and on a Monday morning when, when rubber meets the road and life begins to happen. How do you respond to things that are not Christian? Things that are not kingdom? Things that are not of God? Are you quick to give in for the, just to keep the peace? 
Are you willing to take a stand and say, no, that's not godly. I'm doing it this way. I don't care if everybody's against me or not. This is the standard that God set. Because when you think about it, the cross was a standard that God set. But not many showed up at that standard, at the cross. And there's a verse of scripture out of Matthew 23, starting at verse 37 uh, through 39. This this just blows my mind. Um, you know, and I've mentioned this scripture before, but I want to read this to you this morning, and, and I want I want to show you the heart of God. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase used before. Um, the burden of God. The burden of God. We don't think of God having a burden. But I want you to think of this. Jesus said to take my yoke upon you for my burden is light. Hmm? Jesus said his burden is light. So that means Jesus has a burden that he's carrying. Wow. You don't think of God that way. You don't think of God almighty up in heaven who made the earth, made the stars, made the moon, raised, the, raised people from the dead, did the, all this powerful, miraculous stuff. You never think of God having a burden. But when we go back and we, we, we look at that verse of scripture in Matthew, and Jesus is talking about coming unto me and finding rest because my yoke is easy and my burden is light, we, don't, we, we will forget the fact that Jesus just said, I have a burden. Wow. God has a burden. Mm -hmm. He's got a heavy burden. For you and me. For the lost. For those that are broken. For those that know better and do it anyway. For those that are sitting in places this morning that think they're having church and they're getting this long list of do's and don'ts shoved down their throat and are walking out insignificant like they don't matter and how can I ever match up to this list because I will never get there because all they're doing is preaching legalism and preaching junk that scripture does not uphold. And they walk out of church more bound than they walk in because they're not taught truth. Or maybe being in a situation, I know of a church here in town, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to say the name because I'm not into all that stuff, but I know of a church here in town, that pastor actually believes that sin will not keep you out of heaven. Preaching lies and false doctrines and, and things that the word of God does not support. And they're bound. They're bound. They will walk out and they're bound. They walk out bound in legalism or they walk out bound in this lie that I can live however I want and still get to heaven. Wow. What a mess. What a mess. So Jesus, this, 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 I want this to just kind of shake you a little bit this morning. Because this, this, what Jesus says here is just unbelievable. Jesus has a burden. And as he's going, on, he's walking to Port Jerusalem. He's up on the mountain, and he's walking out toward Jerusalem, because Jerusalem kind of sits down in the valley and is surrounded by mountains, is what they say. I don't know. I've never been over there. But in this instance, he's walking on this mountain and looking over Jerusalem. It's his hometown. It's a place that he knew where everything happened. It's a place he knew the Savior of the world himself was going to die on a cross, be raised from the dead, and that all salvation was going to come to him. He knew that this was a place of miracles. He knew this was a place of the house of God. He knew this was a place people gathered for all the sacrifices for their sins and where they try to find the priest and they try to find truth. And Jesus, all of a sudden, he's looking over the city, and this is what he said. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her? 
place like God. Holy Spirit. Thank you. Taste the best of chips. Adam lift that word up my soul. Under her wings. And you were not willing. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I'm going to read this again. I want, I want you to think about this. This is Jesus' hometown. This is, this, is, this is his hometown. And he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her chicks? under her wings, and you were not willing. But the, the warning here at the end is what grabs me. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That, that rips me. Jesus is looking down on his hometown and he's saying, I have come to you. I've done miracles in your house. I, I, I've, I've done great things among you. You've been set free. The anointing of that, 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 is, that God worked through me. You know, you've seen people raised from the dead. You've seen people healed. You've seen the miraculous of the feeding of, of thousands of people. You, you've seen me do many things. And I've not one time contradicted the word of God. Yet you were not willing. Wow. Wow. That rattles me. That, that rattles me. Because what Jesus is basically saying is the truth was preached in your Jerusalem, in your hometown, and you did nothing about it. Your hometown, you've been praying. And I'm sure these Pharisees, and I want you to understand this. When he's looking at Jerusalem, he's not saying that there's not people there praying. The scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees pray three times a day, an hour each time. Are you praying three hours a day? Uh oh. They pray more than us. They had set times every day. They had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. You have the first five books of the Bible memorized. Most of us are lucky to memorize one verse. I mean, this is real. No, I mean, that's, that's no shame on us. I'm not trying to be shame on you. That's not what I'm saying. It's not what I'm getting at. If these, these people gave 10% of whatever their earnings were, and of course, they went around bragging about it, and then gave some on top of that. I mean, are we doing that? Are we, are we an active in that? Are we, you know, these people knew the truth. They, they knew the principles of Scripture. Yet the Savior walks in their midst and they miss it. Wow. That, that, that blows my mind. That the Savior walks in their midst, does all of these miracles, and they miss it. Why? Because you can be so blinded as a Christian with your own agenda and your own understanding of what you think God is and what God says that you miss what he's actually doing. See, we, it's easy to get caught up in things. And, you know, I, I, I call it Christian fads is what I call it. It blows in today and it blows out tomorrow. It's called styles. It's called whatever you want to call it. Things that we like or dislike. It blows in today, blows out tomorrow. And when it comes to Christian fads, I don't get caught up in it. I mean, yeah, I've got my own styles. I've got my own things that I like, that kind of thing. But I don't get caught up in it. There's only one thing that we need to get caught up in, and that is, what is God doing in this time and in this hour and in this day? Amen. Amen. What is it? And then ask ourselves a hard question. God, what is it in me that is blinding me to what you're actually doing? What you're actually doing among us? What you're actually wanting me to do? And Lord, help me to be willing no matter how silly it might look. Because I'm telling you what, there's some things that God will have us to do, we will look a fool. True, true. 
We will look in such a way that people are like, what the heck did they just do? And it worked. Because you were willing. You were willing. We, 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 think of, we think of St. Joe and Easton and Cosby and Stewartsville, and we think of, you know, Platte City, this, all this whole region up in here, going northward up into, up into uh, Maryville, just, or Marysville, or whatever that is, how you would say that, all up in this area, this whole corner of northern, northwestern Missouri, and we think of this region, and we know there is a key in the kingdom to unlock the potential of the spiritual in this area. We know there is. There has to be. People have been praying for decades for massive revival in this area. People have been praying for great moves of God in this area for a long time. And it's yet to happen. Notice I said yet, because I still believe God's going to do it. It's yet to happen. Why? Because I believe that there's a spiritual key somewhere. And I'm praying God show me. There's a spiritual key somewhere. Somebody knows where it's at. Somebody knows what it is, and they're not stepping out to do it because they think it's too silly. They don't think it's going to work. We've tried that before. It didn't work. We, 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 we thought about that before. Well, we, we, well, you know, we've done that 10 times and it didn't work. What, what about the 11th time? There's somebody out there that understands, somebody out there that knows that key. And the one that definitely knows the key is God. There's something. God did not leave our area to be just like Jerusalem when Jesus is walking down into that city. And I, 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 I hear about all the miracles, and I think about all the things that God's done here in just, just this area. I mean, was it 2017, 2018, I think it was, when we were doing um, Hope Over St. Joe and, 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 uh, and, and St. Joe, and we were, we were having, I mean, miracles were happening in, in, outside in the park. I mean, God was doing some stuff. Miracles. We would go and knock on people's doors, and we wouldn't invite them to church or anything. We just knock on, knock on the door, say, what do you need prayer of? And people were getting delivered and healed and saved, baptized the Holy Spirit right in their doorway. God's doing something. God wants to do something. My question, my, my question is, though, is where is the key that unlocks the potential of all of that across the board, where it just floods like a river, where it just moves all across the board, everywhere we go? Because when, 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 when I think of Jesus and I look at that Jerusalem, and I think about all the things that God's done in our area, I ask myself, God, do you see our area no different than you see in Jerusalem? Do you see our area and it makes you weep? Because the Bible says Jesus saw Jerusalem and he wept. He was burdened. He was burdened. What's your burden for our area? You know, it's easy to get caught up in our own life and busyness. I get that. Believe me, I know. I, I know. But sometimes it's so easy to get caught up in life itself that we forget about the burden of God for our area. Amen. 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 Sure. When does the burden of God become second nature? What if the burden of the Lord became the very essence of our breath when we woke up and the dreams that we dreamed about when we fell asleep? What if we were the ones that say, because notice, notice what it says in those verses, you were not willing. Jesus didn't say you didn't measure up to a standard. Jesus didn't say you didn't have enough education, even though that's good, even though, even though that's necessary. Jesus never made any of those statements. He said you weren't willing. You weren't willing. I can't get that out of my heart. I can't get this out of my mind. 
And you know, God's got this sense of humor of just shaking me sometimes in a way that I don't quite understand. But he always sets it up. You know, I've always felt that call to missions. I've always felt that call to, to go out and to minister to people and minister on the streets. And I've done that all 30-something years. I've, I've, I've faithfully done that one way or the other. Whether it's in prison or a nursing home or on the streets itself or whatever, that's 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 a, the laws. That's the heart of God. That's the heart of God. But the question is not whether you have time. Jesus didn't say, oh, do you have time for this today? No, he said, are you willing? What does that mean? Jesus is saying, I don't want your excuses. I want to know if you're willing. Amen. Amen. We, can, we can give excuses all day long. I don't have time. We don't have a big enough church for all the manpower. Believe me, I've used that, I've used that excuse before. <laughs> because there's some things that float ahead in my mind, like, man, God, I'd really like to do this. I'm thinking, yeah, but I need like a hundred people that actually put that together. And it's not, you know, it's just things that hit my mind, and I think about it. And it's not that God's lined it up and asking me to do something, and he's stirring something in me, obviously, but it's, it's, it, I, I don't know what that is, but you know, my prayer is that when a time comes, and I look at it, and I evaluate it, because you know, you got to plan things in order to make things happen, or you look like an idiot that's just so unorganized, and too many churches have done that and just messed things up. So you have to be organized. But when God begins to plant something in my heart and I begin to look, my, my prayer is, God, I don't see any excuses. I just see a yes, yes. Yes, I'm willing. Yes, I'll go. Yes, I'll do. Because when you look at when you look at the word and you look at in the book of Acts, let's go to Acts chapter 1 real quick. The last, the last words of Jesus was real simple. Real simple. And, and I don't know about you, but I have a tendency when I hear the last words of somebody before they leave, I'm going to hang on the words. Because whatever someone has left me with at the end of whatever it is before they left, it had to be the most important thing that they were trying to get to. Why do you think it's so important that when we leave, our spouses, our kids, our family, our friends. Why do you think it's so important that a lot of times what we do before we leave the last words out of our mouth? Love you. Why? That's the most important thing. Well, Jesus has one of the most important things too. And he, he, gives, he gives some really powerful instructions. He says in verse 4, And gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, You heard of for me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And the disciples, <laughs> verse 6, And so when they, when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it time that you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? These, these men were still blinded by their own agenda. They weren't caught. Jesus is trying to get truth to them, but their agenda is blinding them. What's their agenda? They want to see Israel become basically the nation of the world again because right now it's under Roman Empire. And Jesus is like, you're so caught up in your own world, in your own issues, in your own things. I'm trying to get some truth to you, and you can't even see the truth I'm getting to you because of your own agenda. Does Jesus stop there? No, he doesn't stop there. He keeps pushing. He said to them, and he kind of rebukes them. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the epochs, basically that's the seasons, which the Father has fixed by his own authority. What's he saying? You don't need to know that. It don't matter. It don't matter. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall uh, be my witnesses both in Jerusalem 
and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up into the heaven. Wow. What was Jesus' last words? Get baptized in the Holy Spirit to do what? Speak in tongues? No. So you can prophesy and lay hands on the sick? No. So you can sit here and raise the dead from the from the you know from the from the ground? No. So you can feed thousands of people by miraculous feeding? No. All those things are great. I don't mock any of those things. They're great. But here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that he said you're going to get baptized in the Holy Spirit for power and authority. Why? That word actually means dunamis, which means explosive. You're going to have explosive power in your life to do what? Be a witness to me throughout the world. So we get, we, we, we love baptism in the Holy Spirit. Well, I, I'm not baptized in the Holy Spirit. So, I, you know, when we get caught up in this whole idea of, well, I'm not speaking in tongues and we get discouraged. Or I'm not prophesying and we get discouraged. Or we're not seeing dreams and we get discouraged. Or, or we're not seeing visions and we get discouraged. And we get discouraged because we're not we're, we're caught up in our agenda of what we want instead of the purpose of what you need. Do, do you see what I'm, see what I'm saying? We get, the disciples had their own agenda. Jesus, when are you going to restore Israel back to the great nation that it once was? When is, when is your time coming? And what does Jesus do? He rebukes them and says, basically, in a sense, it's not your business. I don't even know that, but the Father does. But this is what I want you to be to make your agenda. This is what I want your agenda to be about, reaching the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' last words weren't even, I love you. Wow. His last words weren't even come to the cross and get salvation. Think of that. Jesus' last words were when it wasn't go preach that I just rose from the dead and, and witness the miracle of resurrection or whatever. That wasn't it either. What was Jesus' last words? Go be a witness to the world. Get the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. Begin to follow the Holy Spirit. And don't be like those people in Jerusalem that said, that, you know, saw the miracles, heard the truth, but they weren't willing. And made Jesus weep. You know, I, I think of our area. And, and I, I just, I think of just everything God's done around here, the stories, the decades of things that I've heard, things that have occurred around here, and I'm talking, I'll go way back, even when historical within the last hundred years, and I think of the purpose that God's given for this whole area, and how we are not living up to the purpose that God's given to this geographical area. How we've fallen behind, and we've gotten caught up in our own agendas, and we have allowed the enemy to do what? Come into our camp and steal everything we have. You know, we sing that song earlier, I'm going to do what? I'm going to take back what the enemy stole from. I'm going to what? The enemy's camp. Oh, I don't want to go to the enemy's camp. Why? What are you scared of? Don't you believe that God gave me authority over the enemy? <laughs> well, I, I don't want to stir up that. Why? Do you not believe that God's given you authority over that? Go take back what he stole. Go, go, st go stand your ground when someone's trying to forcibly cause you to uh, be in some kind of moral collapse or go back into your addictions or go back into a lifestyle that you don't need to be in. Stand up to that and say, no, God's got a standard. He's got things that are going on in my life and I'm standing by this, the Word of God and what He's telling me in my life because I love Him and, and, him and the Word of God more than you. Amen. And that Amen. might make, make you mad, Amen. but that's okay. Amen. I've had to tell family members that I don't know how many times they get, they get questions on certain things. I've been no mad. And I look down straight and I said, I, I know you're upset. I get that. That's fine. But I'm going to let you know right now, I love God more than I love you. And that's the way it will always be. So you might as well just accept that. And here's the standard. And here's the thing. Why? Because we go out and we want to compromise like the world. And then we wonder, why is my witness not working? Why, why, is, why, 
how can you compromise and be like the world and expect the world to want Jesus when you act just like them or you do just like them or you watch stuff just like them or you think just like them or you whatever. You got to do it a different Amen. way. Amen. You got to do it his way. Lining up with the word of God, lining up with scripture, lining up with what he wants to work through you in your life. And as you begin to do that, the witness begins to shine. You begin to stand out. You begin to walk in a room and you don't even say a word and you're standing out. Why? Because you're carrying something from heaven with inside of you that you're walking with. Not fighting against, but walking with. Mm -hmm. See, we spend so much time fighting our flesh, fighting this, fighting that. Well, what if we spend more time just walking with God? Yes, yes, Lord. <laughs> just walking with God. All you stupid things go away. I'm in God's presence. Leave me alone. Amen. You know? This, this thing starts coming back, trying to creep it out, you know, trying to pull us down again. What are you doing here? I'm in God's presence. You don't want her. Tell it to go. Tell it where it belongs. <laughs> Bible says that we're foreigners in a foreign land. That we're citizens of heaven on earth. In other words, when you're born again and your spirit fills you, you're living for God and, 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 you're, and you're saved, you're living for God. What's the Bible telling us? The Bible's telling us this ain't our home. We're just visiting. Mm -hmm. Thank God. Because I tell you what, I don't live here forever. I don't like what I see, and I don't like what I smell, and I don't like what's going on and all around me. I don't want to live here forever. Amen. You know, this is going to be the... I want you to think about this. If you're a born-again believer, this is the closest thing, earth is the closest thing you'll ever get to the sense of what hell will be like. Thank God for that. So when, so when you're as a Christian, you're, you're seeing all this stuff going on. And I've, I've, heard, I've heard Christians make this statement, man, I feel like I'm walking through hell. And I sit there and I say, you know what? You kind of are because you're living in this earth and you're from heaven. Amen. And there's a lot of sin going on. There's a lot of things going on that is contradictory to the witness and to the power of God that should be working in our life to change this world. Yeah, that's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you know what? As a born again Christian, this is the closest thing you'll ever get to. So you want to see Jesus today. You want to get saved. And you say, yeah. And you connect with them. And they get saved. This morning, are you willing? What deposit inside of you? What unique thing? Has God implanted inside of you that is a key to unlock the witness that this area needs? You know, I don't think she cares if I share this. If I do, just rebuke me later. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Jackie, Jackie has a business down in the South End. And there was about, about a week, it seemed like those people were just showing up um, from whoever, whatever, from all areas, all ranges. And it's like, and we were talking, and I told her, and I, told her I said, man, I said, God's just bringing them to your doorstep. <laughs> just bringing them to her doorstep. And, you know, to work through that, you know, when, when certain situations happen, then here's, here's the hard part. That sometimes certain situations happen, and when they happen, we wonder what we should do about it. That's just our natural tendency. What should I do about this? But when they show up at my door, and I've been praying for the laws to do something for the laws, and they show up at my door, I thought, man, God, you got it going on. I didn't even go searching for this. It's like at my door. And here it's showing up at her door. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. When you, get, when you begin to get a heart for the lost, you begin to get a heart for God, that's saying, you know, things begin to just show up. Yeah, it's kind of like that straight cow, where'd you come from? Oh, yeah. Or that stray dog, where'd you come from? Why? Because the word of God says, when we lift Jesus up, what do you do? 
He draw all men unto us. Go back and read that verse. When we lift Jesus up, what's he going to do? Draw all men unto us. Why? Because we are the resemblance and reflection of Jesus as a born again believer. And people are coming, they're drawing, they're pouring in, they're coming in, dropping off at a business, doing whatever, you know, these stray, well, strays, I guess you'd call it, whatever, just start coming from everywhere. Why? Because the Spirit is drawing them, and they, you hold it with inside of you the deposit of truth that can set them free. When God looks at your life, and I'm going to make this personal now, when God looks at your life, as he's looking at your life, can we be? Or does he see a willing heart that says, Lord, send me. Lord, use me. Change me from the inside out. Lord, I don't want to make any excuses anymore. If you said it, let's do it. As long as it doesn't contradict your word, I'll be in line and we're going. And why did I say that? Because God never contradicts his word. saying, I got this excuse. I got that excuse. Hide your excuses this morning. And just say, God, I'm willing. You know, it's so easy. It's so easy to sit back and complain about this and complain about that instead of making a difference. It's easy to complain. Easy. And I'm, I'm guilty as that as much as anybody else in here. It's easy to complain. But to actually make that difference, to actually say, yes, Lord, how can I do, how can I be different in this? What can I do different in this? You say, oh, Lord, God can use somebody else, but he wants to use you. He wants to use you. When was the last time you invited somebody to church? Last time you invited to have someone pray, just pray, someone pray with them? To read the Bible with them? I know I'm stirring some of your deep, some, some of yours, you know, I, I, God's doing something. When he looks at my life, when he looks at your life, my prayer is that God doesn't weep and, and, and say the same thing that he said to Jerusalem. I was in your presence and did miracles trying to get your attention, but you were so caught up in your agenda, you missed it. I hope God never says that. But how many knows it's so easy to do? That's why we pray about everything. Amen. We take everything before God. Well, if we need to buy a car, we take it before God. We need to buy a house, we take it before God. If we're switching jobs, we, we take it before God. If we're about to get into a relationship, we take it before God. Whatever it is that's going on, we take it before God. Why? Because we want to be willing if he says no. Amen. And we also want to be willing if he says yes. I want to read this, read this to you again because there's something that's so powerful here that I want you to catch out of Matthew. Matthew 23. I got just a quick question and then we'll tie this up. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. In other words, God's trying to get your attention. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, and you were unwilling. Behold, 
your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on you shall not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What is that? That's when he comes back. Did Jesus give up on these people? No, the people gave up on Jesus. Wow. I don't see any list of that. I don't see I don't see anything in here that Jesus says about a list. I don't see anything in here about you weren't good enough. I don't see anything in here that says you didn't pray enough or know the scripture. I don't, I don't see anything in here that says you weren't saved the right way. I don't know how people get caught up in that, they do. I don't see anything in here that Jesus is saying except for the words you were unwilling. Wow. So I want you to think of something. When it comes to our journeys, our journeys are unique and they're all different. Amen. Amen. But there's one key element in every one of our journeys that if we miss this, we shipwreck every time. Our willingness. Our willingness. That passage works the heart out of me. Because how many times in our life did God speak and God said something, but because we either doubted it, we didn't like it, made us uncomfortable. Maybe, maybe we read something in scripture and it jumped out of us and we knew it was God speaking to us, but we didn't want to change. How many times have we been unwilling? I don't, you know, God is, Jesus, I love what it says here. Jesus is trying to gather the chicks under his wings. What is he saying? Why does a chick and gather a hen? Why does a hen gather the chicks under the wing? To protect them. Amen. To keep them from harm. But what is Jesus saying? He's saying, I have come to love on you like a hen chick and on the, on the, to, to gather all my chicks under the wings to protect you from the world, to protect you from the defilement of the world, to protect you from what's going on around you, to protect you from all the harm that is headed your way. But because you've rejected me and you're unwilling, for I say to you from now on, you shall not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What's Jesus saying? You're not going to see this again until I come back. And then you were forced to be willing. Wow. How does this heavy? So man, I went to church and I got heavy. I thought I was going to walk out happy. <laughs> we walk out happy. Joyful. Full of God, full of the Spirit, full of, full of love, full of what He wants for your life. Because this morning we're going to say, Yes, I'm willing. This morning you are going to say, Yes, God, I'll go. Yes, send me. Yeah, I might be like Moses and got a stuttering problem, but you know what? You gave him a mouthpiece. You know, you might be Elisha. And thinking, I'm young and dumb and don't know a whole lot in my, in my walk with God. But you know what? All of a sudden, Elijah showed up and mentored me. You might be in a situation where you're thinking, well, I don't know enough. And all of a sudden, you get wisdom and just starts flying in your head. You're like, where in the world did that come from? That was the Holy Spirit. Just beginning to reveal things to you from the Word. All because you had a willing heart. All because you said, yes, Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to stand up. I'm willing to say yes to Jesus. Not because I've got it all together. Not because I'm perfect. I, I just got it all together like the Pharisees, if religious people do. But I'm doing it because I'm willing. I'm willing to say yes. And I tell you what, if God was willing to bless this mess and put this mess 30 years later or more, 
from where I'm at now, you just believe you can definitely do that in your life. There's something about God taking a mess and making beautiful things out of it. And some of us are a mess. Let's just get real. We're a mess. I was telling Angie, I was telling Angie you know, I, I go through times of self-reflection sometimes, just kind of evaluating my life, evaluating some things going on personally and family, just different things. I told my, I told my wife, I said, you know, I said, I said, I just, I just been thinking about this, this is where God's been tapping me just for a few minutes. And I said, I've been reflecting on some things. I said, man, I'm a mess right now. And here's the thing. I was so busy on other things and other agendas and other things that I was doing for God. I wasn't even focused on the fact that I got some mess to clean up. Wow. Does that, does that mean that your mess is necessarily your fault? Maybe. It might not be your fault. Then again, it might be your fault. But here's the bottom line. God's able to take that mess and make something beautiful out of it. And all he's looking for is someone to say, I'm willing. That's it. So my, my question to you this morning is real simple. Are you willing? Are you willing? Are you willing to go the extra mile? Are you willing to say yes, Lord? Are you willing to say, I need more than just reading the Bible? I need more than just praying. All of those things are wonderful. Those are needed. I need more than that. I need so much more than that. I need God to use me, and I'm willing. No matter what that looks like. No matter where that's at. Just to say yes. God forbid that he'd look back. And we're standing in judgment day. And Jesus is weeping. And he's saying, put your name in there. I wept over you. I tried to gather you, but you weren't with me.